Good morning. You know what? I love how we can say we have a friend in Jesus, and we also get to say we have a friend because of Jesus. And I love how you guys were hugging and smiling. Everyone's smiling now. Everyone loves each other. And that's what God has called us to do. He has called us to love one another, and we're all better for it. <coughs> there was a saying that I saw a lot growing up, and sometimes, I'm going to admit, it kind of bothered me. Because I, I would see Christians doing it. And when I was younger, I would always look at adult Christians and I would see some of the good things they did and some of the bad things they did. And I quickly learned right off that I wanted to be like, that's what I want to do when they did something good. And I don't want to do that. I want to do something different. I want to do something better when I saw them do something that wasn't quite right. <laughs> but I remember growing up and I would hear this saying and I, it would really bother me for a reason. And that's the saying, I'll pray for you. Now a lot of you will probably be like, what are you talking about? Isn't that what we're supposed to say? That is absolutely what we should say. But one of the reasons why that kind of bothered me was I remember growing up, I would see hear a lot of Christians say, I'll pray for you. And then one, they would either not pray, or two, they could have been the answered prayer that God was going to send but then didn't do anything about it. Like someone would share their heart out to somebody and say, I'm struggling with this. I need help with this. And then the Christian would go, I'll pray for you. Because it, it became a very, it's something I realized, it could be an easy spiritual cop-out. It's the right thing we should say if we legitimately do it. And then it spurs us to do something. It transforms us. <laughs> But it can also be something that is a cop-out. And I don't want our prayer lives to be that in regards to service. You know, someone once said that prayer is the beginning of some of our greatest works of faith. But prayer is also our greatest moments of hypocrisy. And I thought about that for a moment. And part of the reason for that was because we would say, I'll pray for you but it would just stay there. But we know as Christians, prayer is meant to be something more than just asking of God. It's something where we're showing our complete humility and dependence on God and for God to be impacting our lives so that we can impact the lives of others for His name and for His praise and for His glory. But sometimes we don't do that. I think we need to change our view on how we're going to pray. Pray for ourselves, pray for each other, and pray in view of God's glory. Because sometimes we'll just say, I'll pray for you because it sounds really religious. It sounds really loving. But if that's all that it comes to, if that's where it stops, I think we're missing the boat. You see, one of the things that God tells us Christ teaches us is to pray for God's will. Is this something that we do on a daily basis? Now, a lot of times we'll say in our prayers, if it be your will, Lord, but do we really understand the words that we're saying when we say, God, may your will be done? Because when we pray that prayer, we're saying we're giving up complete control because sometimes, God, you're going to ask us to do something we don't want to do. You're going to sometimes ask us to do something we've never done before, and sometimes you're going to ask us to love and forgive people who are not lovable or easily forgivable. But are we willing to pray, God, your will be done? You know, a theologian said that one, sometimes we struggle with this because we know we're taught by Christ to pray for God's will. But our prayers are sometimes, and much of the time, halted in its power and effectiveness because often what we do is pray for our own will to be done and for God to bless it, rather than the other way around. And do we ever do that and say, God, may your will be done, even when it's difficult, even if it causes sacrifice, 
But those are the prayers that make a difference. Because that's what Christ has called us to do. You know, we know from this passage, the disciples ask Jesus, they say, how do, should we pray? And Jesus taught them this. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts and as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to say some kind of canned prayer, but the elements of that prayer are things that he wants us to do in our prayer lives. And this is one, some of the things that we learn about prayer. Prayer teaches us, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray teaches us how we ought to live our lives. I mean, he starts with worship of God, our Father, that relationship, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. No, hallowed be Micah's name. Or Sin Road's name. How would be God's name? And he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we pray that prayer? Is that the priority of our lives where we say, God, this is my passion. If, you, if I wake up in the morning and you say, what do you live for? What do you want in t out of today? You say, God's will. Even if it means me lowering myself and Christ exalting, God's will be done. Then we ask for our daily bread. We understand providence. Every good thing comes from God. So our hearts are always ones of thankfulness. And he shows the importance of relationship. God forgive us as we have forgiven our debtors. You know, there's a peace. There's a relationship that we can have with God. But God doesn't only care about that relationship that you have with him. But he cares about the relationship that we have with each other. And Jesus teaches us not to, to, and he teaches us to pray, to lead us not into temptation. He's making the call for holiness. You know, this is how we ought to be living. But do we pray this prayer, especially in view of serving other people? Because this is how often our prayers are. Dear Heavenly Father, please God, give me what I want. Bless my dreams. Bless my hopes. Help me to be financially reasonable. Help me to have really good health. Help my kids get into that great college. Bless me, God, and then make that your will. What if we approach the throne of glory completely differently and humbly? Because when you pray to God, if you pray biblically, if you pray in the way that Christ has called us to pray, you leave getting up off your knees a completely different person. Because prayer is not just asking of God. It is a spiritual discipline God has given us to be spiritually transformed. Because when you have the right heart with the right motive, according to the Word of God, there is no way you can leave the throne of heaven differently. You would say, I am a completely different person because I was just in the presence of God. How can you not be in the presence of God and not be completely changed when you have the right heart? But I, as I realize, the more that I think about our prayer lives, how do we pray? When we pray to God, is most of the content really about God? You know, one of the things I love about the book of Psalms is that it's not focusing so much about the psalmist, but it's saying, God, I just want to be in your presence. God, I want to be for your worship. I want to be for your glory. God, you delivered us. And so many of the prayers were just focused around God and who he is and what he has done. And because of that, that just changes our mindset and how we ought to approach life and how we should change our view of other people. So many of our prayers, how much of our prayers are about other people? You know, they say that 90% of our time that during the day we spend thinking about ourselves. Is 90% of our prayer lives the same way? Because one of the ways to change in our view of how to serve God better, to serve other people better, is to change the way that we approach our prayer lives. So are we praying with the view of God's will? You see, one of the things that I learned about prayer is prayer gives us a glimpse into our hearts. 
You know, sometimes people will ask, how do I gauge my spiritual condition? I know I'm supposed to be spiritually growing. I know I'm supposed to be glorifying God. I know all these different things. But how do I know how I am spiritually? How do I know that I'm continually going upwards in the way that God has called me to? The answer is evaluate your prayer life. One, are you even praying? But two, look at what you're asking of God. Is your prayer full of worship? Is your prayer full of requests for other people? Are your prayers for the will of God to be done? Because so often, the glimpses of your heart, the desires of your heart, really come out of your mouth. You know, Jesus made that known. Out of the heart comes the desires of our heart. What's coming out of your mouth in prayer? That shows you where your heart is. You know, one of the things when I first was coming here to Kokomo to be interviewed, one of the things that you don't realize was I was interviewing you guys as well. I was still unsure whether or not I wanted to come yet because I was praying for God's guidance in that. But one of the things that I evaluated was I got to spend time with our elders. And one of the things that I wanted to see was I wanted to see how they prayed. I didn't want to just hear charismatic type prayers. I wanted to see what kind of content did they have and were their hearts in it. And that's one of the things because I wanted to know, I want to follow a leadership like that. And one of the amazing things was I got to be around your elders, our elders, and they were praying up some prayers and I got a glimpse of their heart. And that's where I was thinking, I could follow men like this. You know, I think one of the first prayers I heard from one of our elders was actually from Rob Millspaw. And it was such an encouraging one because it was really about worshiping God and serving God and really that being the focus. And then you, I often hear how people pray, but then I try to compare their prayer lives to their actual lives of faith. What are they actually doing? And then I look at a guy like Rob and I see all the things he's doing for God and I'm just thinking, I see why his, his real life is so strong because of his prayer life. And I know why his prayer life is so strong because he's putting God first. And I thought about that. That is the glimpse of our hearts. That's why sometimes when you guys are offering up prayers, sometimes when we say amen, I am so encouraged because I hear hearts lifted up for God's glory. Because that's where it should be. It gives us a glimpse into our hearts. We also understand that prayer ought to lead us to action. One of the things that you read throughout Scripture is that prayer is a precursor to action. Nehemiah prayed, and he didn't say, God, just, just be with Jerusalem. He said, maybe I'm the answered prayer that I am praying right now. And he took action. We look at David and how he prayed, and then he took action. They waited upon the guidance of the Lord, the wisdom of God, the counsel of God. But then when God gave them that wisdom, they took action and they did it boldly. Moses would pray and then he would go and do it boldly. Paul would pray and then he would go evangelize boldly. Their prayer lives didn't just stop with the request. It continued on with action. And pray to be part of God's will. Let God use you to help you answer your prayers. You know, one of the things that I really pray for for our congregation is to help people pray in view of them being part of God's answer to that prayer. And because you miss so much spiritually when you don't do that. I mean, how many of you say you pray for the Kokomo to be reached with the gospel? We pray for that. But then how many of you say, God, let me be part of that process? You know, one of the things that really impressed me was I was talking with Tony Ayers, and Tony was saying, you know, I pray for lost people, and this last Wednesday, he prayed for his friend to come, and his friend came to Bible study on Wednesday. He didn't just pray, he took action. He took the boldness to go out and invite somebody. Think about our U.S. parents. How many of you our parents. How many of you have had children? Okay, raise your hand. On the count of three, I want you to name how many kids you have, okay? One, two, three. 
The answer you gave is wrong. And the reason for that is look at all the great work that Tom and Bonnie, Mike, and Peggy do with our youth. You do not just have two kids. You do not just have three kids. You have a congregation full of kids that I know that you pray for. But does it stop there? Do, do you just say, God, I pray for our kids to grow up godly in a godless culture? Or do you say, God, I pray that they will be godly in a godless culture and use me to participate in influencing them? Let me serve alongside them. Let me teach them. Let me set example for them. Let me mentor them. Because if that's all you're doing, your prayers aren't going far enough. Now, how many of you have parents and grandparents? Raise your hand. Okay. On the count of three, tell me how many you have. One, two, three. <laughs> Under a bit. Okay. Well, you little smart Alec. <laughs> He's our grandfather of grandfathers. But think about that for a moment. We have a congregation full of spiritual mothers, spiritual fathers, spiritual grandparents. How many of us go and visit? How many of us serve for our golden agers? A lot of our ladies, you guys do a great job. You don't just pray for our elderly. You actually participate. Because your prayer life goes farther than that. You are part of the answered prayer that you pray to God. And that's where we need to start asking. God, don't just... God, reach the lost in Kokomo. We should say, God, use me to reach the lost in Kokomo. God, pray for our youth. God, use me to help our youth. God, I pray for our elderly. God, use me to help our elderly. Do you see how that changes our approach to prayer? Because now we're, we bought into God's vision. We're vested. We're supposed to do those things. You know, one of the things that we often do is we kind of have a faith. What, what kind of faith do you have when your prayer life only finishes off at the amen and does nothing else? James chapter 2 kind of gives us a glimpse of this. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. And you guys know this passage pretty well. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God. Good. Even the believe, demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now we know in James the first chapter also, James is telling us, if you're going to pray, you got to pray belief, believing it's going to be answered. Not being this double-minded person. You've got to pray with faith. Otherwise, your prayer is useless. Then in chapter 2, we learn that faith without works is dead. We talk about that all the time. But here's the thing. Prayers should be said in faith. We learned that in James chapter 1. Authentic faith requires action. We learned that in James chapter 2. But if you combine them together, we should see that prayers of faith should lead to actions of faith. Because that is real faith. There would be nothing better for Satan to say, hey, if all they'll do is pray but not live out authentic faith, obedient faith, submissive faith, Christ-serving faith, if they won't back up that prayer with legitimate, action-oriented faith, they're no better than my demons. And he would be satisfied with that. 
Now, I'm not saying prayer isn't effective. It absolutely is. But one of the things we know about prayer is if you're sincere about your prayer life, it transforms your heart. And it transforms how you view people. You want to know how to become a more compassionate person? Pray for people. And then you, are, you see more of their needs and you do something about it. Where you get so stimulated that you say, I have to do something. You move away from the, I should do something or I want to do something. You say, I have to do something. Because that's what my faith demands. And I'm glad to do it. That's why prayers of faith are so powerful because it leads to actions of faith. But one of the things that when I think about is Jesus never asks us to do anything that he isn't willing to do first. And so he taught his disciples, this is how you should pray. Your will be done. And do you remember the words that he prayed while in the garden? In the garden, he said these words. In Matthew 26, verse 39, it says, Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus prayed the hardest prayer. He asked us to pray that prayer, and he actually prayed it. And he actually lived it. And he actually did it. Now, his own will would say, God, destroy this evil world, take your angels, and bring me back to heaven. That could have been what happened. And Jesus would have been just in doing so. But he said, God, may your will be done. But when he prayed that prayer, he knew it was going to be sacrifice. He knew it was going to be hard. He knew he wasn't going to be the greatest beneficiary of the sacrifice. He said, okay, God, I know that your will means being tortured. I know your will means being beaten and mocked and crucified in front of my best friend, in front of my mother, in front of women, and between two criminals. So it looks like I'm just as guilty as they are. With the weight of the world sins so much on me that instead of being defined as holiness, I'm defined as sin. Knowing, Father, that your will means you turning from me because you can't be in my presence. Knowing that your will means I will die. Knowing that your will means I will be buried and that I will have to trust you in faith to rise again because I had never risen from the dead before. But Jesus prayed that prayer and he did it. The great thing about Jesus' example is that he didn't just say, God, may your will be done. When he said that final amen, he got up and he said, it's ready for me to get arrested. He said, I'm ready. He didn't just say, God, have someone else do God's will. He said, may your will be done. And then he got up and he did the Father's will. That's the example our, fa our Savior, Jesus Christ, gave us. Is that the way that we pray? God, may your will be done in my life. And then say amen. And then do what Jesus did. Get up and go do the, his will. If we do that, that will transform how we serve Kokomo. If we do that, it will transform how we serve each other. Because it is God's will for you to love each other. It is God's will for you to serve each other. It is God's will for you to encourage each other. And when we do that, when we offer up godly prayers with His will, with His name being glorified, with other people on our hearts, we walk away from prayers transformed in new people saying, I must be a servant. I must be like Jesus. I must go about my Father's business. I must do His will. That is the passion and desire of my heart. And I pray that prayer because that is the desire of my heart. When we make that the desire, our prayer lives change. And when our prayer lives change to fit Scripture, we change. That is what God has called us to do. So I'm calling upon all of you to pray. 
Pray fervently. Pray daily. Pray without ceasing. Pray in faith. Pray with God being glorified. Pray for your brothers. Pray for your sisters. Pray for our youth. Pray for our elders. Pray for our leadership. But don't just pray. Pray for God's will to be done. And then be part of God's answered prayer by getting up and doing His will. Church, I believe we're going to be a praying church that does God's will. So if you have that desire, if you have that commitment, that I encourage you to show up by standing as we rise and sing our song of invitation to those who want to come forward and give their lives to Christ.